the poet <coughs> goes on fabricating excuses for his timidity here and indeed there will be time to wonder do I dare and do I dare here he again blames it on time saying that I have much time and there is no need to be in a hurry and then he applies the question of daring to his uh, affair though it is uh, an ordinary dull life uh, affair but as we said because he is too timid he uh, magnifies this affair looking at it as a difficult task time to turn back and descend the stir the image of the stir is a frequent symbol in, in Iliad as it was also a major symbol in uh, Dante's the Divine Comedy um, in Dante it is a mystic uh, metaphorical symbol for that spiritual evolution but here in in Iliad's Prophrog the star is a material uh, symbol rather than mystic and it stands for this effort and difficulty of taking this journey to uh, the room where his lady is um, because here he says that I have much time to, to, to ascend the stairs and then before I go to the end of the stairs to the top of the stairs I change up my mind and then I descend back then before he reaches the bottom of the stairs he again changes his mind and uh, this and ascends reascends stair and he's trapped actually in this process of procrastination and hesitancy with a bald spot in the middle of my hair, my hair they will say how his hair is growing thin here there is another allusion to uh, John the Baptist of course there is no mention of John the Baptist here Frank mentioned but rather um, those who uh, are acquainted with uh, John the Baptist know uh, that he was uh, he had he, was, he, he used to have a, a bald spot in the middle of his hair so when Prophrog said with a bald spot in the middle of my hair he is giving us a gesture or uh, a reference to uh, John the Baptist here he uses John the Baptist as a, a, a mask like a mask which he wears to hide his personality and uh, he, when he compares himself to the great task and great issue of that prophet, he is actually not, uh, he is not ridiculing the prophet himself, but rather, Prophrock is ridiculing his own, uh, ridiculing himself rather than the prophet. Because his issue, as compared with that of John the Baptist, is actually dull and uh, ordinary or trivial life of her they will say how his hair is growing thin again the reference to the thin hair reminds us of John the Baptist because that was one of his idiosyncratic aspects or features my morning coat my collar mounting firmly to the chin my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin here there is, we have a description of his own clothes the frog here uh, is self-conscious of his own lack of beauty or lack of handsomeness he is aware of his clumsy awkward clothes and his uh, clumsy personality and here this is another excuse for his timidity he says uh, which is that he lacks the necessary beauty or handsomeness which may encourage him to to go and tell that woman about his love my necktie rich and modest but notice the way he described these clothes in an in a mock epic terms I mean he uses uh, lofty profound and uh, s uh, and supreme diction high diction like morning morning let's say ascending uh, mounting mounting I mean mounting ascending firmly rich 
modest, asserted. You know, these words or this vocabulary uh, can note courage, can note greatness, can note knighthood, you see. But in fact, he applies these uh, this uh, supreme embellished uh, diction to a trivial matter, which is his own color, which is too big, he says, his own morning coat, his own ra- necktie, which is... Uh, rich but modest, and his and and furnished with a small pin, which is asserted as he says. So it is not he who is asserted, but the pin of his own necktie. This is uh, funny and ridiculous at once. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Again, he is aware of his clumsiness. And thinness, again, reminds us of Tony Baptist. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. Again, the motif of uh, rev- decision and revision and hesitancy and time goes on here. For I have known them all already, known them all. I have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Here, again, uh, Prefrock goes on repeating certain motifs, as we said throughout the whole poem. This goes with the time motifs. I have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. We have a catalog here. We call this device a catalog or cataloging device by mentioning a list of related things. Here, the catalog refers to uh, times of the day. He says, my evenings, mornings, afternoon have been familiar to me. I have known them and I have lived this experience before. And I have developed a a sense of disgust with the whole issue. Because they are, all the times are the same uh, to me. And uh, he seems to have, to be, to be bored. And uh, with these, with these times. And he has lost any kind of enthusiasm or zeal for life. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. We have uh, another conceit here, or far-fetched image. He, how can anybody measure, how can we measure our life with a coffee spoon? This is an image which is grotesque and vague at the same time, like all conceits. He may mean here that his life is trivial, as small and trivial as um, sugar maybe as familiar as sugar which we use uh, every day without knowing it in an automatic triv- um, familiar way so his life is so trivial that it can be measured with coffee spoons or that there is nothing interesting in his life except drinking coffee so drinking coffee or tea here is another motif which refers to the sense of familiarity, the sense of routine, deadly routine, uh, in this uh, dull life. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a further room. The voices here refers to the voices of the women in the room who are sitting together talking about Michael Angelo, as we said, beneath the music from a further room. And the music here comes to his ears from that room which is the target of the whole uh, poem. So how should I presume? Here he blames it on the music. He says the tune maybe and the music is dull, not that inviting. You see? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And here he blames it on the eyes. The eyes of that woman, he says, are too keen, too fierce that he cannot confront them. He lacks the courage to confront or that lady into the eye or to look at that lady into the eyes because her eyes are too keen, too fierce, too powerful and that they fix him like a phrase, like a well formulated phrase. You know, this is another conceit here. In uh, front of her eyes, he feels like a sentence which is very well phrased or formulated. 
and when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin? In another conceit, he likens his feeling in front of that lady to uh, an insect. He says, I feel like an insect which is struggling on a pin. Imagine that image, the image of a small insect on the head of a pin struggling endlessly and helplessly. When I am, or like what, or like a picture which is pinned with nails on the wall. And this uh, series of conceits, of course, denotes helplessness and uh, impotence. Then how should I begin? When he feels in such a way, he says, definitely I cannot begin and I cannot initiate any, any uh, thing. To spit out all the but ends of my days and ways and how should I presume? Here he says, do I have courage to spit out the but ends of my days and ways? You know the meaning of the word but ends? The last part of the cigarettes that smokers leave and uh, throw away. So he say here that his days, his, his days, his uh, works, what he, and his works and days are as trivial as the but ends that smokers throw here and here. And sometimes they tread them. Uh, by their feet and how should I, should I presume look at the sense of disgust which he has developed with his life because he says he says that he spits out his days and ways like butt ends from his mouth when the sense sometimes smokers sense of disgust with the business of smoking becomes too great that they don't I mean they don't uh, take the, the butt end out of their mouths but they spit it out like that. And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are bracelets and white and burn. Here he uh, gives us, Prophet gives us here an image of the arms of that lady, arms which are white and braceleted and burn. And this is a, an erotic image, which uh, for a moment gives us a clue that Prophet will finally have the motive to proceed and, and tell that woman about his love but immediately between parenthetical parenthesis he uh, again uh, resumes his hesitancy but in the lamplight downed with light round her again he gives another excuse for his timidity which is that these arms are not attractive and hurry and we know quite well that this is a false excuse. This is not the real, real reason why he doesn't proceed. It is, is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Here he blames it on the perfume. The perfume could be not inviting and not good and not attractive. And this is what makes me digress from going, he says. Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl and should I then presume, and how should I begin? You see, uh, again, the reference to the arms, and there is a reference which are the arms of that lady, and there is another re reference to the shawl. A shawl is part of her dress. You, uh, something important here is that we never see the woman. Prophet is talking about that woman whom he loves, but we never see her. We never meet her in the film. We only see her throughout his own eyes. And what Prophet does here, because he is timid and he lacks confidence, self-confidence, and uh, in front of that lady, he uh, dissects, he, 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 he in fact manages a kind of dissection of her image. I mean, he divides her image into separate parts, and he dwells at these parts one by one. We don't see a fully-fledged, complete image of that lady, but he talks about parts of her image, the eyes, uh, the arms, the shawl, her dress, the fingers, you know, um, the skirt, as he's going to, to, to talk about in a few minutes. So uh, this is a kind of defense strategy to um, counterbalance his own lack of confidence in his own, as we said, timidity. And we see more images about the lady. 
Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke pipes, the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of the windows? Again, this goes on with the smoke motif. None. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seats. Another image here, which is this goes with sea imagery, the motif of sea imagery. Here, Prophrock compares himself to a pair of rugged claws. That sea creature, which is furnished with claws and uh, struggling at the floors of the silent seas. This is an image which denotes, of course, uh, helplessness and frustration. Uh, and in the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smooth by long fingers, asleep, tired, all its malingers. Stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? Again, we have another catalog here, which is related to times of the, of the day, afternoon, the evening. He says, the, uh, he blames his timidity here on the atmosphere. The atmosphere, he says, is dull and melancholic and not inviting, because the afternoon is so dull that it is as if it is sleeping so peacefully. The afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smooth by, like like a cat maybe, which is smooth by long fingers. You see another conceit here. He uh, likens the evening uh, or the afternoon to as to a cat, which is smooth by long fingers. These long fingers, of course, are those of the lady. You see the idea here, and. Uh, the evening, he says, is asleep and tired, and it malingers. Of course, it is not the evening which feel, which is like that. It is he who feels like that, and it is he who is in need of being, of being smooth by these long fingers. This lack of lack of love and lack of compassion. Stretch on the floor here beside you, you and me, and again the meta, the, the, the the dichotomy of the pronouns. There is some there is something which is stretching here. He says beside you and me and which prevents me from having the initiative to to uh, make his proposal of law. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, another catalog here, but this time the catalog is related to food stuff. Tea and cakes and ices are the preliminaries that they are supposed to take when they sit on one table. These are the things, he says, shall I, after tea and cakes and ices, shall I have the courage, the necessary courage, to force the moment to its crisis. Notice how he equates the word ISIS, which is a trivial, dull, with the word <coughs> crisis, which is, of course, uh, which in deno denotes an overwhelming uh, crisis or effort. This is, again, part of <coughs> part of the mock heroic effect. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am not prophet, and here is no great matter. Again, he compares himself to John the Baptist here, Yahya bin Zakaria. How do we know that? Because he says, though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, it is Yahya bin Zakaria who is known for his uh, excessive weeping. He, he wept much, he fasted much, and he prayed much, that prophet. Though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, and the reference, Prophet said, I have seen my head, my, my cut head, uh, brought on a, a golden dish or a platter. Platter is a dish. So the reference to too much praying, fasting, and um, weeping, the reference to the cut off head on a platter, on a golden dish, of course, they remind us of the story of John the Baptist, as we said, whose head was cut by Herod and presented on a golden dish to a Jewish dancer, as I said. But he corrects himself, saying, I am not prophet, and here is no great matter. This is one of the lines, the very rare lines in which Prof. Rock tells the truth, because he says, uh, I am not prophet, actually. I, I am neither a prophet, nor is my issue as great as that of the prophet Yahya. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. Here he blames it on a footman. He uses the word footman with capital F at the beginning. The word footman refers to a, a, a mythic uh, creature with one big foot 
and one big eye and it says it is this mythic creature which is holding my coat and preventing me from going ahead in fact there is there is no footman the only footman is his own timidity his own lack of initiative and courage this is what what uh, prevents him from <coughs> going ahead that's why he immediately says and in short i was afraid this is again one of the rare lines in which Profrock tells the truth. Everywhere else he is fabricating, he's lying and fabricating excuses. But here he, he tells the truth. No. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea? Cups and marmalade and tea, another catalog, food stuff, which they are supposed to take before they uh, discuss their affair. Among the proceedings, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question? Again, we have an allusion here to a, a poem by Andrew Marvel, in which uh, a love poem, love song, in which the poet here uh, invites his lady to come to join him in love, and he says, once you join me, he says, we will roll the whole universe into a ball and run after it. So this is an image which denotes euphoria and happiness and elation. But Prefrock says, even if I uh, squeeze the universe into a ball and roll it, then this ball will end at the same dull, trivial, overwhelming, routine question of to go or not to go. To say I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head should say that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. Here he compares himself with Lazarus. Lazarus, as you know, or Lazar, he is the person who died and who was restored to life by Jesus Christ. And uh, he says, I am Lazarus, I am also back from, from death. And I am telling you about my own hell, the hell I saw. In that through that death we also remember Guido here the speaker of the epigraph who is also telling his hell to Dante but what is the uh, Profrox hell Profrox hell as compared with that of Lazarus or Guido is dull and trivial his hell is nothing but this routine dull life his hell is if one of those lady is uh, if that lady will say to him Will, will reject his love and say to him that he misunderstood her and that she never intended to encourage him to take any initiative or to make any love proposal. Being ridiculed and being rejected by that lady, shedding his pride through that effort is an enough hell to him, he says. Okay, and would it have been worthwhile after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets, the dorias and the sprinkled streets? After the novels, after the teacups, after the skirt that tray along the floor. Again, we have another uh, catalog. We have other catalogs here. Sunset, Dorias, and Sprinkle Streets, related to the setting, were novels, teacups, and skirts that along the floor. Another um, catalog. Novels which he reads have, have become trivial and routine. The teacups, again, which he takes, have become dull. And there is a reference to the skirts, trying the very long skirts which are training on the floor. Of course, the skirt is part of the dress of that woman. So this goes with the image of the lady. Um, no, the last part, if we, if we move to the last part of the poem, no, I am not Prince Hamlet. It starts this way, no. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. We have uh, three negations here. No, powerful no. I am not Prince Hamlet. Another negation, I am not Prince Hamlet. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. A third negation. He, I, although I have been comparing myself to great figures in the history of humanity, like Hamlet, but I am not as great as Hamlet, nor is my issue as great as him. Nor I was meant to be here. So here in this line, no, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Uh, we have also an allusion to Hamlet's famous soliloquy or to be or not to be. 
I'm not, I was not meant to be. I'm not as great as Hamlet. And I cannot apply that question of to be being or not being to myself, he says. Then what is he? He says, I am an attendant lord. That one will do. That one, one will do. One that will do to swallow progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool. Differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous. Meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. He says, I am not fit to play the role of the hero. I am only fit to play the role of uh, an attendant lord, like Polonius, maybe. One who helps, and one who, sorry, who, who attends the hero and who helps him, maybe. Uh, but I cannot hero a whole play. I cannot be the central figure in the whole play like Hamlet. I may start a scene or two. I may initiate one scene or two, two scenes. I may advise the prince, but I cannot be the prince himself. I am nothing but an easy tool. Notice the word tool here. Phonologically reminds us of the word fool. So he says maybe I'm more fitting to play the role of the fool. A fool like Flanonius. Like, like, rather than a hero like Hamlet. Differential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous. Full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. Notice here that the style here and the wording, the vocabulary and style here reminds us of the uh, um, style of Polonius. Polonius' style is always like that, full of bombast and full of, uh, and full of uh, too much uh, figurative and ornamental language but it, it is meaningless in most cases or it is uh, not because it is uh, not equated with action it is nothing but hollow talks uh, because as you know Polonius and Hamlet is aware of this I mean Prophoc is aware of, of this he has this aspect of too much talking like Polonius but without taking any action. That's why he says, I am full of high sentence, like Polonius, but a bit ridiculous, obtuse. This high sentence is not accompanied by any action, in fact. Um, remember when uh, Polonius uh, asked Hamlet what he is reading, what are you reading, my lord? Hamlet's answer was, words, words, words. He repeats the word, the word words three times because Hamlet is aware of his lack of action and that he is a man of words and not a man of actions and he is uh, disgusted with his own uh, with himself as Prophoc here is also disgusted with his own attitude almost at times the fool I grow old I grow old I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? Notice that one aspect, stylistic aspect of the style of this poem is that it is in most cases, uh, uh, in fact, interrogative style. You know, interrogative, I mean, it is related to questions. But Frog doesn't, doesn't say here rather than affirmative. He doesn't use the affirmative, but he uses the, the, the interrogative because of his hesitancy and impotence. So he doesn't say, I shall part my hair behind. But he says, shall I part? The, shall I part my hair behind? He doesn't say, I dare to eat a peach. He says, do I dare to eat a peach? I mean, he's always hesitant. The image of eating a peach is an image, a romantic image, which denotes courage and denotes sin also. Eating a peach reminds us of the image of eating the forbidden tree or the apple tree in, by Adam in paradise. So, uh, will I be, he, he, he may be saying here, will I be as courageous as Adam who ate the forbidden tree? He's not sure, of course, he's hesitant. Shall I part my hair behind? Can, can I, uh, I shall wear white, shall I, shall I be like young boys, courageous and daring like young boys who part their hair behind, who wear white flannel trousers and walk up on the beach? I have heard the mermaids singing east to each here. In this line, you have a reference to the mermaids, who, which uh, appeared to Edisus in Homer's epic, the Odyssey, 
You know that in that epic, a group of mermaids or sirens appeared to Odysseus and his men, and they seduced them by si by singing to them a very happy and a very beautiful tune that the men were lulled to sleep, and they followed those mermaids into the sea, and they and, and they were drowned because of that beautiful tune. He says here he imagines here that he is one of the crew of Odysseus's ship. One of those men who are lost and seduced into the sea by those beautiful mermaids. And then the poem here ends with a beautiful lofty dream. For a moment Prophrog is lifted beyond all his triviality and grief and uh, dullness and melancholy and routine. And he feels one with Odysseus and his men. I have heard the mermaids, I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the, blo the wind blows the water white and black. He says, I have seen them. The word them here refers to the mermaids. I saw those mermaids playing on the seashore, combing the, the waves, see. And this is a beautiful image of the, the poem, therefore ends with this beautiful image of the mermaids playing on the seashore. Uh, we are lifted from the dull image of the women in the room talking and gossiping about Michelangelo to the beautiful image of these mermaids which, which, in, which, is in, which is connected with myth and with vision and charm and classical antiquity. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown. He uses the pronoun we here. Of course, after he has been using the dichotomy of you and I, here he, he uses we, which includes both the I and the you. And maybe here the we is, uh, refers to the men who were seduced by the mermaids. And he includes himself with those men. We have been lingered in the chambers of the sea. We have been drowned in the chambers of the sea, in the sea, by those beautiful mermaids. Mm -hmm. um, Still human voices wake us and we drown. The last line in the poem will destroy the dream. And yani Prophrock's dream, of course, would, like all dreams, is fragile. All dreams are beautiful, lofty, but fragile. They last for only a brief moment and then they are ramshackled. They are um, uh, because we, when we are aw awake, awoke again, when we awaken from these dreams, we are back to reality. And what happens is that our, our sense of disgust with this ugly reality is in fact maximized, is doubled. We become more disgusted and more uh, dejected uh, than before the dream. Till human wa vo voices wake us and we drown. He says at the end, he says, human voices wake us from this dream and we drown again. So we are awakened from one drowning to be drowned to another drowning. The reference to the human voices refers, the word human voices of course refers to the women, the real women in the room who come and go and talk about Michelangelo. The dull music and the uh, dull voices which he hears from that room. So we are we fall down from the beautiful songs of those mythic women to the dull sounds and voices and music of the real women in that room who wake us with Prophrock. We are awakened from that beautiful drowning and beautiful dream into another drowning. We wake from drowning and at the end of the poem we also drown. Drown, of course, he means that he again drowns into his own melancholy, into his own routine, dull life, into his own consciousness, into his own mind, because this is also a journey in Prophrock's own mind or mentality, um, and he is—he seems to be, in fact, imprisoned in his own uh, dull, uh, disintegrated, uh, schizophrenic mind. And there is no use, in fact. The poem ends where it started. It starts with nothingness, with uh, stagnation, 